Hello, I'm Neil Romanek, and welcome to the second feed roundtable. This time we're looking at esports um, and uh, esports production, and also what esports uh, can teach the rest of the creative industries. Uh, in 2020, you know, sports got hit really hard. We know that. Um, the e except for esports, esports seem to weather the sort of 2020 storm uh, a lot better than other sports did, uh, and there were quite a few kind of well executed, well attended virtual events in the esports world um, that uh, I think really showed what esports can do and, uh, and its potential going forward for uh, even more cool, interesting content that, uh, that I think, as I said, a lot of sports broadcast and other parts of broadcast can really learn from. Um, you know, esports started basically with people sitting at home playing computer games uh, with each other over networks. Uh, and so in, in a way, you can say the pandemic was almost made for esports from the viewer and from the participant side uh, with people kind of stuck in their homes, but really being able to share and experience this, uh, this great entertainment and uh, competitive uh, experience together. So I'd like to introduce our, our guests. Um, we have with us uh, for today's roundtable, Lasse Kempf, who is a director of technology uh, at esports company Blast TV. Uh, he's based in Denmark. He's here courtesy of EVS. We have Anna Lockwood, uh, head of global sales at Telstra Broadcast Services. Cameron Reed, business development manager for esports at Ross Video. And John Samsell, VP of global marketing at Verimatrix. So hello everybody, thanks for joining us. And we'll just jump right in here. And uh, you know, we knew we knew esports was a growing phenomenon. Everybody knew that. It was like professional gaming. Wow, amazing. Every, everybody's you know talking about esports and the possibilities for esports. Um, but nobody knew how things were going to develop um, in 2020. So we knew that there was going to be a problem with sports. Uh, venues were shut down. Um, and, so, and so nobody really knew exactly how things were going to be working in the broadcast industry for for a lot of sporting events um, and especially how esports was going to do um, so i'm wondering if maybe we can just start by looking back at the past year and i'd like to hear your experiences and just kind of what happened with you in terms of your own businesses and then also how your clients looked at esports and what their maybe what their expectations were at the start of the year and then kind of how things went and I think it'd be great maybe to start with Lassa and hearing about Blast TV and maybe what you guys were thinking as you went into the year and were you, were you going, boy, this is going to be great. This is a chance for esports to show off where you're like, oh, this is going to be a disaster. What, what, were your, what were your thoughts and kind of how did it go? And you can maybe tell us about some of the projects you worked on because I know there were a few events that, that Blast had that went quite well. Yeah, no, um, it was interesting for us because when we saw, you know, all the other events and, you know, the people we've worked with, all being told that there would be no more productions. Um, what uh, Blast came to uh, us at the technology team and said is, well, you'll figure this out, right? People can just play from home. And we asked, well, can we can we maybe, you know, limit the scope? Can we make it a little easier on ourselves? And they said, uh, no, we want player feeds from every single player. We want all the bells and whistles. We want all the things. Uh, you have two months, make it happen. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we started uh, looking at, uh, many different solutions you know we had the what if we're not allowed to like what's if what if, what if there's a curfew how do we handle that so we can't leave the the homes at all or uh, fortunately we could uh, put a production together in a studio facility but with you know all the players at home all our talent at home and everything and we ended up having to create some well you know time was short uh, so we used a lot of already commercially available tools and tools maybe not intended for broadcast purpose. But if you use two different vendors and you have two different computers doing it, then you're adhering to the redundancy and the standards that you'd expect from the industry. Um, and I think we ran, normally we would have for our in-game production, we'd have five, 10 people running that. All of a sudden we had a room of about I think it's 60 or 70 computers just taking in feeds from all over the world. We had a giant U shape with 50 machines just taking in video signals from player cams and talent and all these things. Um, so it it was a in very interesting challenge to to take all of the things that uh, you know esports comes from this 
background where you have you don't have the money to go and buy the real equipment you don't have the resource to go and do all the things so it, it's a very uh, it started out very scrappy so we kind of went back to that did all the things you're not supposed to do and then uh, did it at a standard where it was usable for production so we had one system for talents running um primarily to get the video feeds in and all that stuff and then we had a secondary system live all the time with a failover and all these things so we can switch over and we succeeded with that in june so we ran uh two shows in june and in between we managed to fit in a dota event now because now it was online so why not throw in an extra event and an extra game uh and for that show for those shows we used an ob truck uh, we rendered in without any cameras, without any microphones. We just rendered it in and connected a lot of SDI to it. And we realized that the uh, Corona presented to our world a very unique opportunity to go out and invest in a flight pack uh, on our own. So we actually ended up building our own solution in that period until our next shows in uh, October. So was it, um, did you find that people discovered that they could do new things did the, did the coronavirus actually um, expand what you would normally do or because it sounds like from what you're saying there wasn't much sign of like okay we better tread carefully here we better you know it sounds like it was like no go for it it's going to be great i th i think it was i think what we found a little surprising was that with you know new tools and and new ways of thinking about things we could get latency quite low um, but what it also showed is that you can actually put an in a, a very premium experience together without having, you know, all the uh, normal studio facilities and all those things running at the same time. So it, it opened up uh, for us. It, it kind of showed that here's, here's a model that could actually be very interesting to look at, you know, past Corona. But what was also really interesting is that we had very much the rest of the industry, you know, looking towards us. And when we spoke to other professionals, well, they were starting to use vMix and using all these different things and, you know, pro professional TV networks because Corona shifted it from normally, you know, you need to use all the biggest and best and you need to use the very established things. Well, you couldn't, all of a sudden you couldn't use all that. You couldn't use your studio. So anything better than nothing was all of a sudden accepted. So the limits of being able to use these new tools to try out these new ways of working were kind of removed because they were needed all of a sudden. It's really interesting. Um, so Anna, can you talk a bit about kind of what your experience was? It's a very, working with Telstra, you're having a much more of a, it seems like kind of a macro view, a macro view, a more a wider view. Macro view is very small, isn't it? The opposite of that. That's sort of, sort of a, a wider overview of kind of uh, how how things might have been working in terms of connectivity and and being able to um, to distribute some of these events to people. What what did what did you see and what did you hear from some of your clients? Sure. So for us, we work at different um, levels on the infrastructure side and on the broadcast services side. And um, yes, we are very involved in esports uh, events, but we also do a lot of the underlying infrastructure for gaming companies and publishers. So I think we saw uh, a couple of different things over the last 12 months. First of all, on the network side, there was a very large spike in gaming. So just across the board, um, you know, the the requirements from uh, publishers, from gamers, from streamers went up fairly significantly and stayed up. So, you know, we didn't see a fall off uh, after a couple of months. It, it was a big change and um, gaming traffic on uh, our networks and on our internet backbone has definitely seen a very large jump over the last uh, year. Then on the broadcast services side, esports, like many other events, were affected by the pandemic because they could not do the in-person mega events, um, which was exactly what happened on the sports side. But what we found with our clients is esports had that advantage of being digital native and cloud native. Many of the people who we worked with 
before they got into uh, stadium events, were running very successful online uh, tournaments and online events. So they could go back to that experience and really pivot quite quickly to go uh, into the online world and uh, produce new experiences and new events completely uh, cloud native and completely online. So we continued to work with our uh, gaming and esports clients, but instead of the large uh, venue or stadium events that they had planned, you know, we we had to pivot together to uh, move everything back online again. Yeah, of course, that's such a, a huge part of of. E- I mean, strangely, some of those um, those big uh, esports events are almost bigger stadium events than some regular sporting events. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, what, the what other, was, that, was there a real sort of collapse in that area or did you? Yeah. Of course, the other thing that happened is that as um, in certain countries, the stadium experience was able to come back, even if it wasn't full stadiums, we were able to then work with remote production where there was indeed a stadium or a venue event, but most of the uh, production uh, talent and the um, the production people were back in centralized uh, hubs in a different country or in a different part of a country. So again, I think um, the esports uh, producers really pushed that remote production envelope and and uh, said, okay, what can we do remotely using a very high bandwidth, low latency networks that allows us to uh, still produce a massive event out of China or, you know, do a very large event out of Malta. How do we make this happen? So that was, um, again, I think, uh, innovation with our esports um, tournament organizers and publishers to really push remote production forward. And it is, you're pointing out that you know that that global nature of, of esports, and it's kind of interesting to to hear when you hear Cameron next about that um, um, that development in production from um, being <laughs> from from being the the guys in the room cobbling together bits of PCs to try to get something to work to something which is you know distributed globally and and needs potentially big pipes to do that. So what what was your experience, Cameron, this past year, and and with Ross too, and kind of um, you know, what opportunities were there? What challenges did you really run into? Yeah, well, it was a heck of a year, wasn't it? Um, so we, uh, uh, I'll tell you what, I think, uh, I can't remember the exact date. I'm going to just say it was March 13th or something when they canceled that basketball game right before tip off. Um, uh, I think everybody at our company just kind of collectively grew two inches in their chair when they puckered up a little bit like, Ooh, uh Oh, um, because, uh, a, a huge part of our business is sports and live events, right? Um, not only on the manufacturing side has our solution really started to dominate the the large venue control space, um, but we have a production services company, Rosh Production Services, which uh, is predominantly sports and live events. And uh, so, yeah, it was a nervous a nervous couple weeks. Um, and it was really interesting, you know, because as the esports guy, I was sort of the the new guy on campus, even a year into, you know, I started in 2019, but even at the beginning of 2020, I'm still the new guy. I'm maybe the kid, even in certain people's sort of ways of looking. And they're like, well, what's going to happen with esports? Um, and it was like, well, hey, the tournaments are going to happen one way or another. The guys are in 90% of these tournaments are being played online anyway. Uh, yeah, there's the Riot Games and the Blizzards of the world where they would bring them to play in person, you know, in, in a LAN environment, even for their regular season. But really, they don't represent the bulk of esports, uh, Blizzard and Riot, right? They get all the press, which is great because they do such an amazing job. But but really, the the bulk of esports is midsize um, or smaller, you know, and and for the most part those sorts of companies are doing events online for eight to 10 weeks before their one large event, right? Which would be like the playoffs and finals. Okay. 
So I was like, hey, look, those tournaments are going to happen. There's $100,000 on the line and the, the refs are not going to cancel it because because it can be played. Right. The question was, how are we going to get the coverage? You know, because also we predicted that ratings were going to go through the roof with nobody being able to go to school, nobody being able to go to work. Like it's it's going to be a ratings bonanza. Um, so some some much smarter people than me at our company um, got to work on a solution where, you know, we started to think about um, the way that we used to distribute, well, still, but the way that we distribute um, content could potentially be used as a way to contribute content into like an SDI workflow. Um, we knew that there were kind of, and I say this with all due respect, but there were like, um, like lower market solutions out there that have been doing this kind of stuff for a while, right? Um, like your vMixes of the world. Um, but we knew two things. We're like, one, I've never once heard one of my customers say how much they love those solutions, right? Sometimes they feel like, ah, I mean, it gets the job done is like the best feedback I usually get from that. And and, and secondly, they're going to have a lot of kit gathering dust over the next eight, nine, 10, 12 months, however long this is going to last, that they put a lot of money into. I mean, you all know how much uh, a large size format production switcher, a large production video router, <laughs> replay servers, you all know how much that costs. And so if that investment is just going to gather dust, that's, that's, that's not good for these companies either, right? And so... So we started coming up with these solution um, that we call the uh, Ross Production Cloud um, to allow people to stream back and forth, um, not only contributed audio and video from like talent or players, um, but also with the same low latency streaming method for an SDI workflow to stream back multi viewers, to stream back comms, to stream back, excuse me, um, control over, over your production devices, right? Um, with the same methods that we used to distribute the content two years ago, right? Over the last year now, these are now methods of just getting feeds and then we convert it into SDI and then stream it back out to them. And we're able to do it in under 200 milliseconds, right? So then they stream the video to us, we break it out into SDI and then stream it back to them in all sorts of, you know, like I said, multi viewers and everything like that. Um, <clears throat> the solution, uh, thank goodness we were, I guess, as dead as we were for about two weeks because it was about two weeks that it took for Matt and Logan, like I said, those two guys who are much smarter than me, um, to develop this thing. And within two weeks, we had a working model. And so then, oh my gosh, okay, well, let's get a demo going and let's get in front of as many customers as we can, right? Uh, and so that's when we started doing. And then we did our first show around the end of April using the solution. Um, so it, it, was, it, was, it was this crazy serendipitous thing where, it, you know, out of, I think, our greatest moment of fear probably came um, this amazing triumph because actually... We were very fortunately able to have uh, the largest fourth quarter that we've had in the history of our production services uh, department. Um, after I, I think that first and second quarter were both obviously very slow for us. So um, it's been a heck of a year. We've done some really crazy stuff. Um, we're starting to now think about what, well, what does this all mean for even a post inoculated world? Right. Um, and what <clears throat> what lessons did we learn in 2020 that might, you know, be able to just improve the way that we do business in the future or the way that we do production in the future? You know, and those are obviously difficult questions to answer because who knows what the industry will adopt. Uh, but, yeah, it's been a heck of a year. So this this thing about. Um kind of smaller events or relatively smaller events. Are there a lot of opportunities out there that maybe people aren't seeing or that, you know, they could be taking advantage of now, even if it's my, and I, I remember it's sort of an odd example, but I remember somebody talking about doing, there was a, an esports competition that they did at some, 
some um, U.S. agricultural convention, you know, like farmers' gear and equipment, and it was one of those tractor, you know, those tractor games, um, and they had like a full-on, you know, the esports setup and competition with the the tractor games. Um, so there's kind of there's a lot of opportunity out there to kind of do esports content potentially that maybe people could be capitalizing on, but maybe they're just not realizing that, you know, the tools are, maybe they don't know if the tools are available to them or exactly how to, about, how to go about doing that. So maybe there's a, a question there about getting back to your roots a bit and, you know, democratizing esports, if you want to put it that way, or being able to kind of create esports events on a smaller scale, but something that could really be profitable for the people involved. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's tons of opportunity out there. I think that, um, you know, the interesting thing, is, and it's a question I have to answer all the time, too, is like, where's the money come from? And, and there's always all these, you know, big high level questions. And, you know, and to me, it's like, well, it's it's marketing, guys. It comes from the video game developer. And 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 so think about um, and I'll just use like an example of Riot Games. Riot Games can probably afford to make a hundred and million, a hundred million dollar investment into esports if they wanted to. Right. Um, and even if all they made back was 90 million on that hundred million dollar investment, well, from their perspective, they just got a hundred million dollar ad campaign for 10 million bucks. Pretty good deal. Right. And I think it's, it's interesting that, you know, there's, uh, as Cameron says, there's like different tiers of esports productions. I think, um, there's always been these many, many, many uh, smaller productions that's been able to run on smaller equipment. And you saw, you know, all of these tournaments, as you mentioned, Cameron, that they just went online. They just started using cloud services. They just adapted and started using all these techniques that, um, you know, typical broadcast people wouldn't work because it hasn't been tested for 10 years and all these things. Um, what we saw uh, at Blast was that we had this unique challenge where um, we needed to create content. Now, normally, the way you create content, or one way we used to create content, was you take, you know, a steady cam with a link, you send it to the team. So if you have a technical pause, you just show the players. Um, if you need content, you need an interview, you put a mic in someone's face, and you, you get all that stuff. You have that entire universe. You have the arena. You have the studio. You have that to create a ton of content for you. Now, all of a sudden, we don't have the arena. We don't have the audience. We don't have all these elements anymore. And we just saw that the need for our equipment to be able to produce that much more um, exploded. Uh, now we needed to make, you know, after each game, normally you'd cut to the pay players and they'd be cheering and walking off. Now we needed to be able to do, you know, a highlight package straight after the match was done. We needed to start creating more bombers. We needed to you know, keep the engagement up, keep the uh, excitement up around the show. And and that's where, for instance, we <laughs> that's why we invested so much money into our own kids, our own EBS system, so that we could build all this content. Because the need to add, if you want the same experience as a viewer, or if you want to even try and elevate what has previously been done, you can do a lot with what's available out there and what's the cheap solutions. But when you need to be able to do, uh, we have a guy called Joey on our EBS um, and that guy will do 80 clips an hour or something like that and create highlight packages and an absolute madman on that machine. And that's necessary for us to be able to fill out the time surrounding because that's what we have all of a sudden. Yeah, just, to, just to jump in real quick. Um, yeah, I was going to, I mean, you've been sitting there patiently, John. So. No, it's okay. It's a like, great discussion. Great yeah, I'd like to, to hear. Yeah, go ahead. I think what we're seeing is a, a, a massive revenue disruption going on right now. Um, it used to be where, uh, you know, the it, it seemed like the, 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 the power of the revenue kind of rested within a few. And, and, and these were uh, really the, 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 the people that were either broadcasting or, um, uh, you know, putting together multi-rights deals, you know, for, for esports content. And what we started seeing with COVID was the, uh, the esports uh, teams, the leagues, the tournaments were saying, wait a minute, uh, we're, our revenue stream, you know, is, is either getting disrupted or it's not as much as what we wanted. You know, we're looking at ourselves more as content producers now, just not just as a, a sort of an extension of advertising of gamers. And we want to explore new opportunities 
And we were getting, uh, uh, you know, esports companies saying, you know, how do we do a, a, a distribution deal with a telco? How do we actually, you know, uh, get in, get and have our own discussions about rights management deals? We had the the sports broadcasters coming to us and saying, how do we pick up sports esports content and put it into our lineup? Um, and and is this something? How much we should be investing in it? How much should it be secured? Should we be treating this like a movie, like a live sporting event? How do we actually ensure the quality and the and the security of that stream? And so we were starting to see um, conversations that we weren't seeing before at multiple different levels. And I think the only real difference between esports today, maybe in traditional sports and broadcasting, is just the value of the content, right? So, um, for example, you know a a uh, an esports tournament stream is of some value for a, a very limited period of time, and then after it's done, it's it's much less value because we all know the outcome, right? It's similar to a live sporting event, but the difference is the magnitude of of, of the the money that's generated for that for that content. So it's very it reminds me a lot of the early days of of this uh, the streaming live sports industry, and the only real difference is the value of the content. We're seeing the value content of the esports content growing. And becoming looked at more like original content, like a real, like a like a like a traditional sports or a, a type of an event, and so I think people are starting to imagine how they could play a different role. I, I hear it all the time from from esports leagues and, and and tournament guys that they're not making enough money. They're getting shut out of the big prize money or the big sponsorship money. And I think that the broadcast rights money is really um, shaking things up and really causing um, the industry to grow up very fast. And they're looking for partners that can help them get to that point faster. So, any an interesting observation? Yeah, the the biggest challenge I've noticed with like some of those linear rights deals is um, pigeonholing esports into a TV format is really difficult. Uh, I found out the hard way uh, like four years ago. Uh, the NFL Network approached. Uh, approached ESL and, and EA Sports and said, we'd like to carry the Madden NFL championships. Uh, and I was directing that show at the time. Uh, and, and it was like, without even a thought, I think the answer was like, great, let's do it. And then, uh, and now we've got this agreement where we're gonna be on NFL Network uh, the Friday night before the Super Bowl at, during prime time. It was a very big uh, opportunity for us. But then we got the NFL Network's format and they wanted us to do seven acts uh, and they wanted it to be a one hour broadcast, uh, which meant I think roughly 43 and a half, 44 ish minutes of actual content. And we went back to them and we're like, oh, this isn't gonna work guys. <laughs> like there's just no way we can do, we can't do seven acts. We can't interrupt the flow of the game. This isn't how these guys play. You don't understand. and. And so we had to kind of go back and forth and back and forth. And ultimately, uh, we ended up just getting an agreement with NFL Network, which was like, can you just give us a really cheap buyback of time? Because we will go about an hour and six minutes, almost guaranteed. We could go as much as like an hour and 11. We could go as little as 57. So we might actually have to get your live programming to take up three minutes early, too, on the backside of us. But we, we just had to be more flexible than I think TV was used to, you know, like our associate, our, our AD was not very thrilled with all of these ideas. I know Master Control was not very thrilled with all of these ideas, um, but that was ultimately the only way we could really do it um, and still sort of stay true to just the format of an esports championship match. You know, it's like, it's almost, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's like soccer. It's like, look, once it goes, it goes. You don't get commercials for a while. And but that's there's how a, I mean, there's an interesting thing with that, that like most of these sports, I mean, so many sports have been created, but not created, but by certainly shaped by how, by how they've been televised. So, you know, that's happened with, with, you know, most sports that you can think of that there's an element where that sort of the, the audience and especially the TV audience is kind of shape how those games work. Like, you know, football is, football is about commercials, American football you know um and and so do you see you know i wonder how that will work with um with esports uh and when you do have you know especially the opportunities for for ads and ad insertion and ad placement and things like that you know that there's a whole set of different pressures and opportunities there 
and technologies to kind of you know take advantage of those that I, I might affect the uh, might affect the sports. We're seeing a rapid change in, in traditional sports being influenced by esports and others. I mean, you don't have to look any farther than like I don't know if you saw the announcement the other day by BT Sport Ultimate App, where they're uh, really doing different types of fan engagement, you know, overlaying stats, uh, virtual augmented reality uh, experiences, this sort of thing. They realize that they've got to really step up their game and change, and and really the the format shifting from a. Uh, you know, like, like Cameron said, you know, traditional blocks of, of time uh, to actually, what does the viewer want in, and how do you engage with them in an experience that, that's going to that's gonna help them consume and ultimately buy more merchandise and, and become more raving fans and all that. So I think you're already seeing the influence in traditional sports uh, companies are really changing rapidly. They have to. So it'll be as you see that that's that the content is, is in this case pushing back and it's the, the content is going to change. Excellent. Um, so I think, you know, we've got everybody here um, and we could, there's the opportunity to sort of exchange some ideas here. So Lassa, you are, you have, I mean, you probably had like conversations with these guys anyway, but it'd be interesting for you to, for, to hear from you. What is it that you really need, you know, when you, you're, you know, a year ago, you're sort of cobbling things together and go, this would probably work and this would be fine. Kind of looking like in your, your wish list for Santa, um, what is it that you really wish technology companies could come up with for you that would sort of help you do your job better? Oh, that's a tough one. I think, or, or is everything going perfectly? <laughs> no. Um, I think the main thing we found was that the open moving signals through the open internet even when you use all the new protocols, all the new these things, the thing is all of these things are new. So there are very, very exciting new protocols that allows you to do, you know, point to point connections really effectively over the open internet. But the tools to that implements them and how they work are still very young. So for instance, you know, if you normally when you have someone on site, you have, um, you have, uh, you know, the video feeds going back and forth, you also have talk back and you have all of these different things getting that up and running is a little tricky. Now it's definitely doable, but the thing to keep in mind, especially with the, with, you know, COVID is that the people that we needed to get this equipment working were, uh, you know, on screen talent, um, which meant that, you know, when we send out the camera, for instance, cameras that are remote CCU able, you know, over public incident in an easy fashion, you have to do some interesting VPN tunnels and yada, yada, yada with, some black magic, HDMI, all that stuff. Um, we ended up going for, you know, small Sony DSLR cameras because they had a really good automatic function. Um, so I think the main thing right now is is the ease of use of the tools for the people who need to get the signals. And, you know, when we have players through um, doing interviews, when we have a talent through all that stuff, um, the technology exists and you can do all the things, but having... Uh, you know, tools available for the end users that are really, really simple to use is is probably the most lacking thing currently. Yeah, Lassa brings up such an important point because I mean, not only are the talent never technical people, they shouldn't be either. You know, I it would it, it would drive me crazy if even as a director, if I had to do too much technical stuff at home to set up, right? Um, their job's to tell the story and, and they got to focus on that. But in esports, it's even probably just as, if not even more important, that the players have effectively no extra work that they need to do on our behalf. Yeah, you're right? not gonna you're not gonna tell a, a basketball player like, oh, by the way, can you set this thing up before the match? right? Yeah, can like... you put this can you put this camera on your jersey? It's gonna feel a little cumbersome when you're running and passing, and but can you do that for us, please? Like, no, come on, you're crazy. Figure out a better solution. And, and so, yeah, for the players, uh, and, and not only in terms of before a match, a player has things that he or she needs to be doing, right? Focusing on the match, their strategies, reviewing the tape, mentally preparing. They can't be plugging in cameras and, and trying to worry about our stuff. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I lost... Uh, I lost a bit of a track there when I had to, to cough, but, but the, yeah, the point is right. That also on, uh, I remember now latency, right? It, our solution can't add any sort of latency or stress to the player's network. 
um, especially when they're playing online at home, their network signal uh, and their network strength and their latency is of the utmost you know, importance. Um, and, and this is something that traditional sports athletes don't have to worry about. When you tell your foot to move, it generally moves unless you've got a medical condition. Um, but in esports, if you have latency and you tell your character to move, but it takes him, you know, 70 to 150 milliseconds to actually move, that could be the difference between, you know, victory and defeat. Um, and if we added 70 milliseconds in order to get a video signal from that person, then really in a sense you could blame the difference between victory and defeat on us right so that's that's of absolute utmost importance is minimal technical footprint for anybody contributing whether they're player talent anybody else you know is there anything anna from the the telstra side that that you've observed or that you just want to think about just in terms of those networks and kind of working with those, those especially you know over long distances and internationally and certainly the remote production requirements have stretched both the infrastructure needs and the ability to produce um, from uh, either centralized hub or actually even sometimes a decentralized workflow where you might have people in many different locations. So there's not actually one centralized hub at all. Um, so I think for us, it's really been being pushed on the, both on the internet side. So to Lasse's point earlier, you know, how can we use our uh, private internet backbone that goes around the world to peer as closely as possible, either to an event or to a CDN provider or to whoever we're handing off to, so that it's on our uncontested network, internet network, as as um, much of as possible during the, um, the the traffic or the travel. So we've been working a lot to make sure that we have a great visibility and control over the signals as they move on our uh, internet backbone, and then of course, also if it's a fiber connection to make sure that, again, we've got a very um, high bandwidth, low latency, um, uncongested, fully available uh, signal that gives the best experience uh, both for the people who are doing the broadcast production, so the, the camera and directors of the world, as well as the viewers um, watching uh, at home or in, in, in groups. So I think there has been quite a lot of demand on both the internet network and on our overall network. And I have actually been pleasantly surprised, not just at the Telstra network, but at global internet overall, how well it has responded and uh, the fact that you know we we have been able to grow internet traffic uh, globally not just for gaming but very much driven by gaming as well um, and it really hasn't fallen over and we've been able to uh, add that extra headroom add that extra capacity and capability both to private and public networks to allow for, I think, a, a fairly good experience um, across the entire ecosystem. I think for us, when we uh, did our first show in June, we thought, okay, internet feeds, internet, uh, video feeds all over the world. What do we do? So we chose a location where we had two one gigabit connections with two different ISPs. Um, so that, you know, in case one peered better with a certain location, we could, you know, we, infra we run our own network team so we could start doing, you know, this traffic goes to this ISP, this traffic goes to this ISP. And then we put in an additional 10 gigabit internet connection because we thought, how much bandwidth are we going to be using here? Like, how much traffic are we going to be using? And, you know, our network team was very excited and everyone was really excited because we were going to pump some really big numbers here. And then we start looking at how much data we actually use and we go, oh, we're using like 200, 300 megabits a second. Oh. This is disappointing because <laughs> <laughs> because the thing is that what we saw wasn't it wasn't so much the bandwidth because the thing is with live uh, with pictures like this it's not as hard if you run a fairly low like a lower bit rate and even at uh, four megabits you know you can run a hundred feeds at the same time and you're not you're not even halfway to using a gig um, but latency was the main thing for us and then packet loss. 
that uh, like how does this service react when we lose a package does it just completely freeze take a second to come back does the audio continue do we have forward error correction will part of the image freeze like it's a lot of interesting things you have to take care of all of a sudden but we were surprised at how little bandwidth we actually needed but the quality of the bandwidth that we needed needed to be extremely good uh, and and what we also had was that you know um, typically the way you would work with these workflows are that if you need to work on a video file if you need to work on you know a specialized system you move all the data to the system wherever it is and then you move it all back again where what you saw here and what i hear a lot of others have adopted as well is we used super low latency remote control tools so we had the people working you know on our equipment that was connected to the high speed network where it had access to you know all the files or our in game client or whatever it is so they could control it there instead of us having to throw the traffic uh, back and forth because that also helped uh, a lot with latency and meant that on site when something was being switched it happened real time. Um, I don't know, if John, if you had anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. What we started seeing is, um, you know, global security threats going up uh, quite dramatically. Um, piracy, hacking, cheating, all attacking different aspects of, of, the, of the ecosystem. So uh, obviously for broadcast, you know, we're seeing uh, stream rip ripping on the rise and not so much just on a pure esports tournament, because again, the value of that is a little less now. But when you're seeing package deals going through a telco, um, the same level of piracy that's going into a live sporting event or other piece of content, uh, that same network often has the esports content running through it. So the piracy concerns are sort of being up leveled maybe uh, prematurely in esports, but it's certainly, um, uh, we are seeing a, a stream ripping going up quite a bit. And hacking, of course, has been around forever, um, but you know, it's, it's really been kind of focused, I say, on the gaming side um, and cheats and things like that. But what we're seeing is on, because everything's going to mobile, the mobile application is becoming a huge threat matrix, right? You can get into, you can crack that app, you can either copy that app and have a duplicate app, or you can go in through that app and get into your servers and things like that, or you know, st steal private information. It's become a huge deal. So security, I don't think was something that, that, that eSports was thinking of as much, because they thought that maybe the value of the content mostly was on the game side, but now we're seeing as the revenue streams and the revenue models are changing, security is a, a huge issue. So people are in esports are doing things like, well, how do I authenticate users across devices? How do I, uh, you know, manage my digital rights and, and, and put watermarking uh, on my content? Um, how do I make sure that that you know we can have a consistent experience across devices and make sure that content secure? So these are con uh, discussions in esports that weren't happening a couple of years ago; they're happening now. That's interesting. Lasa, are you are you aware of that, or, you, or, or is that something like in a couple of years that uh, esports is going to have to start taking much more seriously? I think um, esports learned pretty early from DDoS attacks that there are certain data you should not share. Um, IP addresses are very, very like if you show your IP address anywhere, um, you're done. Uh, you, most often, you you will be experiencing a DDoS attack and you won't come back. Um, I think, you know, we use uh, esports typically is to, uh, to the end users at least. They are distributed on platforms like Twitch and YouTube, so they handle most of the uh, most of those issues. There's not a lot of, you know, direct to consumer products out there currently. Um, so it's it's not something that I think we're that concerned with for you know for the game clients and all that stuff. Um, uh, hacks and cheats and games have always been a thing. So you use. Um, face it anti-cheat or ACA client or something like that to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, and then you monitor everything. Um, we monitor, we have, you know, the angles of every player. We do a lot of stuff to ensure it, but it's, it's, I think our biggest concern is with the game. And if you cheat in the game, we're not too worried about content because that is, you know, controlled in the, uh, uh, you know, through the tools provided by the, the platforms we use. It's getting interesting, sorry, uh, to, to chime in, but I think um, as we're seeing mixed um, um, you know, experiences, whether it's augmented reality or live gameplay, we're seeing a lot of different API feeds and uh, that are feeding a more rich and engaged experience. And that's an, an area where we're seeing uh, a lot of security concerns going up because people aren't thinking about, you know, who you're partnering with and how secure are they. And so oftentimes 
you'll do a deal because it's a really cool additive value to something you're creating and you don't realize that that's the weakest link. And so again, I think it's just really creating an awareness and I think that the industry as a whole has done a pretty good job uh, you know, of handling elements of security, but as they get into new areas, they're less um, savvy about it. And so there's, there's a level of education going on and then who you partner with becomes really important and their security standards, so anyway. I'll start with a question. I mean, one of the things I think is um, most kind of unusual for people who are coming into esports is just how varied esports is, and that there are so many different kinds of gameplay. And depending on the sport that you're covering, the production and what you bring into it could be very different. So I think from an audience perspective, it would be super interesting to hear from Lassa around how you go into producing different games and you know what are the kinds of things that you have to look at depending on what actually the esport is that you're covering. So I think we've done Counter-Strike, Dota and Valorant, which uh, fortunately for us all have been 5v5 uh, PC based games, which makes it um, a little simpler. Um, from a tech perspective, there's not usually that big a difference. Um, what it really comes down to is um, we are real to get uh, access to the world. We're relying on clients from the game developers to let us observe and get data out, get feed out, get statistics, all of these things that generate, you know, a full, full show, full broadcast. So the main thing that we face is that, you know, some um, CSGO, for instance, is a very, very heavily community-driven game. And uh, and basically, we get a lot of access to the feeds. We can make our own graphics overlays. We can do all these things. Um, other titles, it's they're beginning to open up. And then there are, you know, for instance, some console titles where it's really, really difficult to go in and get that, get that data out. So it's, I think, the main thing that differs is how much extra can we do because the game is a game and we'll show you know we'll have someone directing the experience and we'll find someone um, it's really important for us that the people who produce the show also love the spot that they're producing so it might not be the same team doing counter-strike that's doing um, dota for instance we'll have people who love dota who know the game and who you know will be able to give the viewer the experience they actually want um, in there so it's it's interesting. The tech is pretty much the same. It just depends on what can we get out and which people will operate it. I mean, I, I think it's interesting and we touched on it a little bit at the very beginning to, you know, if I had a question for Lassa and or just the group too, is where do we see these techniques that we've developed for the last year um, as sort of a crisis management technique actually becoming potentially permanent? Right. Um, and that was and so the like question I, I was going to ask at the end. So but let's go with, oh, go with, go oh, with well, that. Let's do that, do that now. I don't want to step on your toes. I apologize. No, uh, no. So I think that's, yeah, I think that's yeah. the director stepping in. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, to me, it's interesting because, for instance, um, you know, in sports, uh, you have crews that will travel from town to town throughout a regular season. And and I think most directors and producers will be honest and be like, oh my gosh, we just love the camera guys in Minnesota, right? They're the best. Uh, we really love the replay guys when we're down in Phoenix for a Suns game. The, the, that crew is just, they're great. We know we're going to get good stuff. And they've kind of got, you know, their favorite locals that they work with all over the place, right? Um, and does this potentially give them access to whoever they want, whenever they want, right? Um, and does that make it, is that is that good or bad, right? Because on one hand, that makes it way more competitive for work. So maybe that's not so good for labor, but maybe it overall elevates the, the quality of productions. It's an it, interesting conversation starter, I think. So I think, you know, a lot of things have been done to try and, and, and uh, get through it. Um, it's always more fun to have, you know, the players on site and be able to use super slow cameras and use all the cool effects. What I think we'll, we'll see a lot more of is that, especially on, um, you know, for instance, a qualifier or not, you know, the huge massive arena shows, you'll definitely start seeing more higher quality production because now it's been proven that it's, it can be done, right? And there's ways out there that's that has a track record for being able to do this and, 
and that's not going back. And I think the really interesting thing is that, um, well, we've been doing a lot of these weird things for a long time, but I think the industry as a whole will definitely start uh, using the, these tricks more. If we go into, let's say we go into a game where we find out that the best of server for this new game is based in a country, a country far away and we don't have time to fly him in or he's like, he's just doing this event and then we need to start doing the next event the very next day. So it's not an option. Well, fine. He'll just remote in. Um, right now, I, I think we're live at this point and the observer who's doing the whole show is in LA and the production's happening in Denmark. So this ability to be able to go out and say, well, we need to put a crew together to do this production and we need to do it now. And we need someone who actually are specialized in it and who works really well it's opened up, I think, our eyes to how available that is at this point. Hmm. Because previously you had that sentiment of, well, if they're, if they're not here, it's not going to work. And yeah, that expectation of like, well, we, I mean, the, you, there's no reason, technically, you, could, you couldn't have done that before. But it was like, well, why would you do it? Why would you actually have somebody, you know, we'll find somebody here. Uh, where it's very much flipped the other way, where it's like, well, why in the world should we bring somebody physically when we don't have to? I'm wondering also if you think, um, do you see like kind of virtual sets and kind of more kind of integrated graphics is going to become more a part of that? Because if you have, you know, right, if I can sit here with a green screen or whatever, you know, that there might be interesting things that you can do with, you know, with a, a small virtual set in a, in a location um, that, that might add to the experience and those kinds of things. So I think virtual sets for me personally is something where there's this fine line between um, when it's when it's to taste, you know, so you augment the experience with it or you choose something fairly uh, calm as your virtual set. And then there's other times where people put you on the moon and there's a spaceship flying by and it and and it becomes too much. There's, there's a fine line there. Uh, the difficult thing with virtual sets and with all these things is that, again, for instance, let's use you as an example if you we had to green screen you out your lighting will have to be very good for it to work well the good keys for doing you know really good green screen are still they're not cheap um and you will still be able to tell the difference between a virtual set and a real set i think it's definitely something that we're going to see a lot more of it's something that we're already seeing a lot more of um it's it's interesting. It's something that I really hope will develop quite a bit. I'm sure Cameron has uh, some input on this. Yeah, we've we've seen it. Uh, so before I talk about any specific sort of like cases or anything, I will just say that um, sort of to echo and add on to what Lasso was saying, I think that virtual set and augmented reality services at this point in time are still a very are a premium product. Because I think that the what you see when Lassa describes a thin line, um, I see a really thick line where there's stuff that looks good, and then there's stuff that I wish they just hadn't even tried. <laughs> personally speaking, right? Um, when I just see it out there in the world, um, and so it's right, with, Ross, with cat ears or something and whiskers and you know, oh, sure, yeah, 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 okay, yeah. So like all the little zoom stuff that you can do, but I, I guess that I, that doesn't even enter my mind. I just mean like. I've seen virtual sets that I'm either incredibly impressed by or virtual sets that I'm kind of like, I could have done without that. Uh, and I don't see much in the middle where I think, huh. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm just either impressed by them or not. And, and so at Ross, you know, we, we've been doing quite a bit with virtual and augmented reality, as you're all aware. We do Sunday night football um, for NBC is kind of our biggest one. Um, but we do a lot of other sort of AR and virtual set projects you know and and at this point that that really is sort of um the drawing line is if you if you're willing to to get what you pay for you can get really cool stuff we did a project with red bull this year they had a league of legends tournament called the red bull solo queue um and it was supposed to be a big live event and everything when they first planned for it obviously that fell apart um, and so they reached out to us and we provided them with this really beautiful virtual set. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it was awesome. It was really cool. Uh, and, and one of the things that we found, uh, Lassa was that, yes, you're absolutely right about the green screen stuff. Um, lighting for a green screen 
is not an easy thing to do, even under ideal circumstances. You need to have carefully positioned placement of your talent because even the slightest you know, move and, and then gets a little bit of green bleeding onto his face, now your, your key ear is cutting half of his face out, right? Um, and so rather than even worry about trying to do that from home, um, you know, our creative team, uh, the company that is owned by Ross is called Rocket Surgery. That's a pretty cool name for a creative agency. Anyway, uh, Rocket Surgery worked together with Red Bull and they just decided let's not bother with the green screen, right? Um, let's put everybody in virtual monitors. So we'll be shooting a set that has monitors like you would have on set. And we'll just put all of our talent in there on their home kits of their home setups, just like you guys and me, myself are using right now, right? And we sent them nice ones. We sent them like a really high quality webcam, a really high quality microphone, obviously, so that we we're getting a really nice video and audio signal out of them. Um, but yeah, we ran into the same challenge with at home green screen. It's like, hmm. again, back to that idea. This is either a premium product in order to look good. It has to be done really well. So we're not even going to bother doing it in any way that isn't going to be top tier. Right. Um, hmm. I think uh, to Cameron's point as well is that we also made the very, very uh, clear decision that if it's not going to look like a bad green screen, it's an awful green screen. So either you do it, you know, so you don't notice it alone. You go, wow, they've really built out their homes. Or you just don't do it. So we send out, you know, we send out um, some uh, eSports gamer lights because they're easy to use. We send, you know, the automatic camera, DSLR, capture card, hat, a poor tech who had to walk through all these people, how to set it all up. Um, and we sent them all backdrops. Uh, so we chose the option of we just simply did a graphic where we had the three different people in instead of trying to make it something that um, could be, well, it really quickly becomes just unpleasant to watch if you don't do it really, really, really well. Hmm. Um, I'm looking for the word, but I can't remember it right now, but yeah. <laughs> so, so watching somebody Zoom call with the palm trees swaying behind them. Yeah, yeah exactly um, where you go. Well, you're not really on the beach where if you spend out and you spend like, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars on a key year and you have a full camera chain in front of you, cool. Then you, you might fool me and right. I'll be very jealous of you. <laughs> um, so kind of looking at the, you know, we're talking about the, the future of esports and kind of how things might develop. Um, and one thing I wanted to, to get onto, and we put this in the, the questions earlier, is um, the esports um, gender problem. <laughs> and uh, you know, one of the things that that, that you know esports is it's all guys all the time. And uh, it's I'm, I don't know what the numbers are, but you know, it, just, it seems like boxing may have a higher ratio of women to men than esports. And I just made that up. I have no idea. Um, but um, you know, and obviously there are lots of women gamers out there, but you know the sort of sheer number of, of men in esports in in terms of um, uh, you know, but esports athletes and players is is um, is unsettling uh, and unsettling because of course it's a it's not like an institution like say football or baseball or things where you have uh, something that's been last you know lasted for decades and you're pushing against something that's really entrenched. It's like this is brand new and. It's brand new and the internet, the internet we keep hearing is supposed to democratize things and I don't know if that happens or not, but it seems strange that it's become so male dominated so quickly and absolutely from the beginning. So I'm just wondering if you have any ideas about that. And then also just from the technology side, because we're technology companies uh, and you know we're, we're in the, the media technology world, sometimes there tends to be a thing of like, well, you know, the content side, that's kind of none of our business. They can do what they want on the content side. Um, but, you know, what is it that uh, that we can do or what should we be looking at in terms of thinking about technology, thinking about how to produce content and, and what influence we might have on that? So that's my spiel. But, you know, what are some of your thoughts about that? And who wants to start? I think we should hear from the woman on our panel. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's definitely something that we think about and talk about a lot on the gaming side, as you mentioned. Um, it's not quite 50-50, but there are a lot of women who love games, play games, enjoy games, and certainly 
um, you know, the younger generations that are growing up now, um, I think it's almost exactly 50-50 uh, when you look at people who enjoy and play games. It's also very uh, at parity in the streamer and influencer side of things. So, you know, there's a lot of very um, successful, influential uh, women who stream games and who uh, curate content on various platforms. But at the upper echelon of the esports ecosystem, uh, there's definitely a gender gap. And it's not just in the players, it's the whole environment of people who are CEOs of companies, uh, working on uh, in front of house and behind house roles. Um, and I think it is something that everyone is actively looking at to see what can we each do individually and collectively. One of the groups that I'm involved in is the EGAA in Australia. It's the Esports Games Association of Australia. And uh, you know the EGAA, like many uh, esports groups around the world, has an active diversity and inclusion um, group. And it's not just women; it's how to make sure that uh, gaming and esports is fun and accessible for people with different abilities, uh, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic, um, you know, levels. Like, how can everyone afford and play in a safe uh, environment that allows talent to rise because esports is one of the few sports where there really isn't any physical difference uh, that we can attribute to success. So it should be a, a sport that is very equal and very on par. But uh, for uh, you know, the reality of it is that most of the esports champions um, have been male. Now, there are women who are very successful in the esports environment who have won both individual and in group environments. So there isn't, it doesn't, it's not like it doesn't exist, but yes, I think um, for, for us, it's really looking at what we can do uh, as a company and what can we do as a community to really make sure that um, the top talent in esports rise no matter what their gender or no matter what their other abilities. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, I, I, I think too that we need to try to um, address this thing from a cultural standpoint as well, right? Uh, there is a great organization called Any Key uh, that some friends of mine are involved with that are really trying to increase visibility, increase accessibility, um, and, and, and address this sort of equality in gaming. You know, um, it's it's no secret. I don't think I'm stepping my foot in the mud. Gamers can be a toxic group of people uh, <laughs> and and they're my people. So I say that, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> from that perspective, sure. Um, but we can do better than that as gamers. You know, there's no need for all of that sort of toxicity all the time. It's easy to fall into it. You're you're competitive. You want to win the game. Things aren't going your way. You get mad. You say some things. That's understandable. Um, like any key and some of these other organizations are really focused on well okay but let's manage that and let's say the right things and not let's not exclude people because the real beautiful thing about gaming where it started was it's a home for the nerds like me who weren't the cool kid in high school you know and mm -hmm. it is supposed to be an inclusive sort of society that we are so how did we become that which we sought to destroy right and <laughs> and uh and, and so, yeah, I would um, I would suggest anybody who's watching look up any key. They're doing really great work. There's a lot of really great women and men involved in that. Um, and yeah, nice, thanks, Lasse. What is your experience? Yeah, no, I, I recognize it. Um, I I studied. Uh, I have a background in computer science, and uh, that was also a very heavily male dominated world and it 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 wasn't that um 30 years ago uh, approximately i think the the big thing is that you know uh the industry as a whole needs to to have a focus on this and and make sure to to create opportunities and you know when someone gets in and you know um, makes it uh, up there be sure to promote them make, make sure people know that 
you know, there's actually a really, really interesting job here. There's a, there's a whole community, a whole world here that's, uh, that's extremely fascinating because I think everyone I know in esports love it, and um, it's it's just up to us to make sure that it's it's we create a space where it's you know it's safe and it's people feel confident in working in it because as Cameron mentions, there's a uh, there can be quite a bit of toxicity in the environment, mm. so it's it's up to the industry to make sure that you know people are aware that on a professional level, especially as well, it's uh, there's uh, absolutely room. Yeah, I, I did a little research prior to this because obviously, from, you know, we all have our own personal experiences and I, I have seen, you know, um, uh, you know, some, some what you could probably classify as harassment, um, things like that. But, you know, I have a limited experience um, in, in the games that I play, but I kind of asked around and, and I was kind of shocked at, at the, the overall uh, assessment that it's pretty prevalent. And uh, a lot of the female gamers are masking their identities or are, are muting their mics and things because they really want to fit in. They want to play the game, but they don't really want to be called out. And some of the names and the words that are used are pretty toxic, right? And I think it's all about, you know, maybe it's the immaturity of, of a lot of young males that are playing and, and not that they're not, they don't have the world experience, you know, to really understand how hurtful and, and offensive some of these terms are. I just don't think they really think about it. I, I think they're it's their raw emotions coming out. They're not really thinking about how do I act as a mature man. Um, but I think also sometimes it's it's about how we how we how we treat um, you know men and women differently. I mean, if you look at sometimes even the interviews of of some of the of the famous uh, streamers or, or or athletes in in esports, I was watching. Um, an interview with Pokimain uh, recently, and the interviewer was talking about, you know, her cute outfit, and you know, a lot of like sexual innuendo kind of talk. And, and it, was a, it was supposed to be an interview about her gameplay, and it was really a lot about her personal stuff. Yet when they talked to somebody else, a male player, they were talking about his prowessness and his and his thinking and all the planning and the prep that went into it. It was like treating him like an athlete. And I thought it was kind of interesting. So I think it comes from, from many different levels, right? Uh, we all have to think about how do we approach this differently. The other area that's, that's kind of interesting is I think revenue is the great democratizer. And I think that if we, if we, if we have men and women's leagues, I don't know if that's really helpful. I, I think it's helpful in one sense that it allows women to prosper and be noticed and play amongst themselves. But the prize pools tend to be much smaller in, the, in a lot of the women's tournaments. And I'm wondering if, you know, we should encourage more mixed um, gender tournaments and things like this. I know there are some out there that are open, but, but, but you know, when, when you're sharing in a prize pool and the money is being shared, I think that's one way you can, you can democratize things faster. But I know it's an interesting topic. I'm involved with the Esports Trade Association. This is a, a topic that's talked about often. And I think it's, it's an evolutionary thing. We're all working on it at, at different mm -hmm. levels. Well, great. I mean, I think it's good to talk about these things and to kind of try to find solutions because, I mean, as we, as we, you know, we've seen over and over, somebody shows up 20 years later to say, guess what happened to me 20 years ago, you know, and I don't think we, we want that to, to keep happening. So, um, well, that's great. Is it's, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead. I think Lassa. it's worth adding as well that, you know, um, it's been, in Denmark, we've had, uh, you know, female CSGO leagues and stuff like that. Um, leagues and tournaments are actually um, it's we see it as well with the teams we have um it's predominantly men or for blast it's the teams who who can provide or the organizations who can provide teams it's it's uh, men teams but the uh, the tournament is not men only mm -hmm. that's just how it is currently and i think a lot of it is to do with as you guys mentioned this whole um toxicity around uh if you are a woman and you are playing video games you I, I hear it too that some people need to you know mute their mics or conceal that fact to be able to play and the thing is you get to a certain point in the game where communication becomes so important that you kind of hit a skill cap mm. and and I think that's one of the the very big issues that are in the industry right now that's a really interesting point yeah that you do have to at some point be you know as, well, as team sports they're not into yeah. like if you have five really talented individuals they'll do well and they'll make some amazing flick shots but they will still you know lose out to a team yeah so i mean there may is there something interesting with that of you know the fact that you've got teams of guys banding together as 
you know, in a, in a, in a very bonded male way that's exclusive of people outside of that group. There's probably some interesting psychological research that can be done there in terms of the, the players and how, how esports teams operate. But do you actually, do you see a, um, is there anything, is, is doing specific women's esports leagues a good idea or a bad idea? It somehow seems like a, a bad idea in one way because you've just, you've separated them out. On the other hand, you have a opportunity to have a, a showcase for women players. So, you know, what, how, how do you think, what is the, the pros and cons of those? I think um, I'm probably the not the right person to ask because I'm mostly focused on our tournament sure. our technology. Um, it's difficult, right? Because on one hand, uh, the great thing about eSports is that anyone can compete no matter whether from or gender or anything else. On the other hand, we also have a community right now where uh, where it's you see this difference um, in participa in participation. So yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. Oh. Yeah, I think that, I don't know, really. I, I, has there been research done that tells us there's a definitive answer to that? I, I'm not sure that there has, you know, if, if there was, I would probably defer to, to whatever wisdom that came up with. I think the real point is um, there's probably an argument to be made either way, as long as we as an industry show that we care and we want to do the right thing. That's the most important part, right? To me, um, so. And I think a lot of women players would prefer to be in mixed uh, groups if they could, but like any sport, the only way that you're gonna get better at something is by doing it and by competing and by learning. And if your pathway is through women competitions because those exist and you have access to them, then certainly a lot of the Australian women um, esports players have taken full advantage of that. And then, you know, if they get a chance to compete in a mixed team, I think that would be their preference. But certainly the ability to compete howsoever, if it's funded, is uh, something which everyone just jumps at. So I would say that uh, all female tournaments are not necessarily ideal but at the moment if they are, exist let's take advantage of them Thank and you. perhaps perhaps that sponsors also need to take a hard look at this and really make sure that there's universal enforcement of anti-harassment rules and things like that i mean many tournaments have these in place but i don't know that enforcement is is really there and how do you enforce it right it's kind of it's a little bit cool. iffy so i think that again education and sponsorships sort of saying hey these are these are the rules of gameplay that, that we want to be proud of and we want to be advocates of and i think it'll change over time in the right way it's just that you know it's an early stage right now yeah i think and you see i was Sorry, gonna say if, you know if, if money's at stake things can change really fast we're gonna have to wrap up here i think um so um thank you so much and thanks for kind of taking some time on that last question because i think as you know as technologists we can sometimes think well that's none of my business but i think it is our business and it's we all have to kind of participate i think um it was great to and hear it from is you. getting better i just had yeah. to look it up uh i see that <laughs> yeah, for valorant for instance which is a <laughs> it's a much newer game so uh -huh. you know it's 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 less founded community so it's a new opportunity you see mm -hmm. Evil Genius is just uh, did a mixed gender roster led by um, Potter, who uh, we actually had as a, you know, one of our analysts at Blast. Mm -hmm. um, and Cloud9 has signed an all-woman Valorant roster. So so you're seeing both things becoming, um, you mentioned you needed to see more commercial activities surrounding this. These are things that are uh, fortunately actively being, uh, being promoted and are, are actually happening. It's great. So, and of course, it's, Evil it's Geniuses gonna, yeah. is run by a woman yep. <laughs> who is very active in these discussions. So good on you, Nicole. Yes. Great. That's a great note to end on. Thank you very much, everyone. That was Dynamite. And uh, you know, this will be available on the Feed website, in the Feed Digital Magazine, and on the Feed YouTube page. Uh, and thank you very much. And uh, have a good day.